All right, welcome to my studio on a evening sometime. I don't remember when this was. It was so long ago that I started recording this video. Um, so this is all about underpainting. I'm just going to talk over top of various footage that I've taken of that whole process. Much of it I've kind of forgotten about now, so I'm kind of revisiting it at the same time that you're seeing it. So this painting is 44 by 55 inches. It's oil, it will be oil after this first part of the video on aluminum panel. So this whole beginning sequence is me going over the light pencil drawing with archival marker. I draw with hard H pencils because it gives me so much more control in the actual design part of starting a composition. I like to draw and erase, draw and erase about millions of times. And the reason I do that is because for any kind of realism, I think it's extremely important to figure out any problems before committing to paint, or marker in this case, and then paint. So as you can see, I'm erasing a lot because I think it's more enjoyable to vacuum up eraser flakes if there's a lot of them than just a few. It doesn't really justify going to get the vacuum. Also, I've heard that graphite underneath paint can sometimes cause problems, so just in case that's the case, I'll get rid of all the extra graphite and just leave marker for my underdrawing. Ah, the smell of umber on a cold September morning. Actually, I don't know when it was, I don't remember, so I'll just go with that. So once I'm satisfied, with the drawing, I get out soft brushes and begin painting with umbers. Uh, this is extremely common. This is something that I just found online when I first started painting in like 2007. During the underpainting process, I'm careful to keep the dark areas very flat. So I'm only applying as much paint as needed instead of trying to make it as dark as possible that where the umber will go in the mass tone in one coat. I'm usually doing two, maybe three, just in that stage. And the reason I keep it flat is uh, so that each brush mark uh, doesn't remain. So of course this method has nothing to do with you know, modern expressionist painting. It's, uh, it's quite the opposite. The reason that I like to keep the paint flat is so that it will not reflect the actual light that is shining on a painting while it's on display. For dark areas especially, um, a very flat surface is necessary to create the illusion of shadows. If So if we see any disruptions in a surface, the mind will see a painting of something rather than seeing the object for what it is supposed to be in the painting. So, In other words, this type of painting is all about tricking the eye. It's uh, You're trying to create a scene that you feel you could step into rather than a picture of a scene, if that makes sense. And so, of course, that kind of process starts in the very beginning. If, um, if uh, you know, if you wanna do something super fast and I learned that the hard way and just get it done, and then later on decide that I want to go for some more higher degree of realism, uh, it's too late. Definitely cart before the horse. Done it the hard way. That's why I work the way that I do now. Uh, one key principle that I'd stress with this part of underpainting is to keep the extended dark areas slightly beyond their borders, you know, so like in air quotes, coloring outside the lines, uh, can really help in the later stages of using color because I find that the theory of painting light on top of dark is um, very useful. I didn't know that when I first started painting. I was always uh, kind of applying paint the same way that I would apply a pencil and just trying to kind of make it look like a finished product, but by going beyond the borders, you kind of keep things soft and then you create the opportunity for new paint to come over top of that because it has to come over the edge again. And I think that's, that's extremely important.
So when I'm working this way, I'm thinking about using the paint to all its potential and its mass tone, where it appears the thickest, and uh, a glaze, so kind of working the paint thinly over the surface. And that helps to facilitate the the thinness or sort of the, the, the flatness of that layer so that I don't have impasto chunks of paint sticking off the surface. Another way to think about mass tone, if you've never heard that word before, is like I always remember as a kid looking at a bottle of um, cola, like Coca-Cola or Pepsi or something, which I don't touch anymore ever, <laughs> and I wouldn't recommend anyone else touch, um, is that it appears fairly dark uh, when it's in the full bottle, and then if you just have a drop or two spill onto a, a countertop or something, it doesn't really appear very dark at all. Similarly with coffee, um, so that's just the, the full thickness potential of the pigment is the mass tone, and it's really common concept in watercolor as well, but with oil paint, of course, you can use it um, from zero to 100 in terms of its thickest possible appearance or its thinnest possible appearance when you're rubbing it like that. The other thing I, I don't do is use any turpentine. I don't feel that it's necessary and I don't really want to introduce things like that into my studio process. So I'm just using a little bit of elbow grease to uh, work the paint so that it appears thinner rather than using something like turpentine. I find that, it, you know, especially with pigments that are relatively semi-transparent already, like raw umber generally is a little bit more transparent than burnt umber. Uh, semi-transparent so or semi-opaque I guess you might say so I, I just don't find that it's that it's necessary I'm not afraid of a little bit of elbow grease got the Puritan ethic going on <laughs> all right as the painting rolls on here I'm gonna take this moment to thank my sponsor Splorps Brand recovery coils. What are Splorps Band recovery coils, you ask? <laughs> well, order them and find out. Pay first and get surprised. So, at this point, I guess I want to have a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, all of the information that I have is just my opinion. Sometimes maybe some of it is pretty accurate, sometimes not. I just want to keep learning, and that's pretty much how I've learned everything that I've done is through experience. So if anybody knows something that I didn't say correctly or whatever, just leave a comment. That would be awesome. Get a hold of me on Instagram. Do 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 do. Uh, well, also want to take a second to mention that. You know, 99.9775% of what I think is interesting about a painting is actually the why instead of the how. So I want to have a lot more of that in future videos rather than thinking about kind of technical information. I think there's already a lot of really good technical, in, in you know, advice online. So yeah, just a thought. So getting back to thinking about some technical stuff right now. Uh, with this sky part, this is actually an interesting thought process. Um, for this painting, I wanted the sky to be a perfect gradient, going from the edge, kind of a vignette effect with darker edges, darker corners, and then, you know, appearing to be like a, like I just said, a perfect gradient, like a fade, you know, just super, super gradual fade. Um, so you'll see that in future, you know, check out the image if it already, depending when you watch this, it might be up, the high resolution finished painting. Um, so to do that, what I wanted to do was first lay down the values as I'm doing here. And what I'm using is actually uh, Gamblin Fast Mat uh, Titanium, I believe. Titanium White Fast Mat. It's, it's just regular Titanium White, but it has an additive in it, I think, just to make it dry a lot faster. And I have that added with my Umber so that it's, it's still just a, a fast drying mix, even though it's not it has a value to it rather than just like trying to glaze it really hard like the like the umber so what this will do for me is get an accurate value and then what I actually ended up doing later was making another fast drying mix but in color eventually and and pretty much just 
painting the whole sky in color, trying to look, get it to look, you know, pretty accurate or, or close to the finished product. And then when I go for my final color layer, if I do have some uh, brush marks or, or like thin areas of the paint showing through, then it doesn't really matter because it's going to be pretty similar in value or end color as well. Instead of painting full color right over top of, you know, like a white canvas or a whiteboard or, or, or a really dark canvas or a dark board, you just have so much more to make up for it. And that's why you aren't able to control the paint because you have to put so much of it on in order for the paint to look like it does on your palette knife in a, you know, thick gob or like that's the mass tone, right? So, um, I, you know, I want to have a surface that looks like perfectly smooth and flat. And so in order to get that, I'm working with these different passages of uh, paint that's already sort of taking, taking me step by step along the way. So it's kind of the division of labor, right? So you're going like 33% three different times to, to get to 100 rather than trying to get from zero to 100 all in one session and then pulling your hair out because it's midnight and you're tired and you want to go to sleep and it's still not what you want it to be. Here again, using Gamblin Fast Matte Titanium White uh, because I want the, you know, if you want something to be incredibly bright, then make the underpainting incredibly bright. If you want it to be incredibly dark, make the underpainting incredibly dark. And that underpainting will help to facilitate a more uh, a brighter or a darker or more saturated uh, overpainting or whatever you want to call it. I mean, actually one of the, the most the simplest but thought-provoking things I heard about underpainting in the last few years of constantly listening to YouTube videos while I paint was um, a lecture by Vincent Desiderio that I'd recommend if you can find it just google him and or you know find him on YouTube and listen to lots of his stuff he basically said underpainting is whatever you do before the overpainting it, there's no rule there's no you know you have to do it this way or you have to do it exactly this many layers or anything like that it can be you know, you can try to make an underpainting that is, looks like a finished painting, basically. And then as long as it's, you know, dry enough or whatever, you can go back and paint over top of it and have none of it showing or have all of it showing through. You know, it just totally depends. So all of this being said, what's the point of underpainting then? I think a lot of people want to just work as efficiently as possible and get right to it and I know I definitely felt that way when I started painting but eventually I kind of realized that there was no shortcutting a certain effect so I think it depends what a person's intention is if you really want to make something that has a particular type of feeling to it then you have to go through the entire process to get there um, there's no faking a Rembrandt or uh, you know and uh, any of those kinds of painters uh, the effects that they got from light there's there's no way to just do that in like a one hour painting session so yeah this kind of process is extremely time consuming but I think in the end if you see a painting it particularly in person where you can really step up close to it you'll definitely see the difference in that a painting done in this way with all these different layers and a lot of tiny brushwork hundreds of hours, you'll see a different painting when you go right up close as to when you step back. I once heard somebody say something about, like another painter that worked in a more uh, large brush stroke kind of a way, say that they like they liked that style because they can see the decisions that the painter made. Well, I would argue against that and say you can see decisions in this kind of painting as well. There's just hundreds, millions more with all the tiny little brush strokes that are made. So you just have to get closer and it's a different experience when you step up close as to when you stand back. And yeah, that's my thoughts so far about this whole process. Uh, thank you for watching the video and I will make more as time allows in the <laughs> relatively near future.